Welcome back everybody to our studies in medieval philosophy. In this lesson what we're going to do is move on to topic number four which is going to spend a little bit of time not focusing on a specific philosopher per se but focusing on a philosophical movement more generally. This is of course the philosophies of the early Islamic world and the influence that the Islamic period and the golden age of Islam actually contributes to our uh, development of medieval Western philosophy. Now, while we're not going to be focusing on specific, well, we will be focusing on specific philosophers, but we're not, this whole chapter isn't dedicated to a specific philosopher in the sense that chapter two was about Augustine and chapter three was about Boethius. Uh, this is just going to be a collection of philosophers. Uh, we will be talking about two main ones, uh, and we're going to begin with the philosopher Al-Kindi. Um, now, like I said uh, just a second ago, we're moving on to looking at and examining some of the basic philosophical principles which were elucidated uh, by the Islamic world. Now, generally speaking, as sort of a, a basic and a brief uh, piece of historical context, it should be noted that during the so-called Long Middle Ages or the Dark Ages in, in, in Europe, uh, the Islamic world experienced what is usually understood as a Golden Age. The Golden Age of Islam was a Golden Age in terms of mathematical developments, in terms of medical developments, in terms of philosophical developments as well. And it is these philosophical principles which are, of course, uh, of paramount importance. Now, we're going to be talking about Al-Kindi, commonly known as Al-Kindi. I'm not going to pronounce everybody's uh, names from the beginning, because as you can probably tell by the way I speak, I'm quite a very much a Western individual, and I often butcher names that are uh, not even in the Western world. I even butcher names and butcher uh, phrases and keywords that for, are from the Western world, because fundamentally, um, reading is just not my forte, as it turns out. Um, and so fundamentally, we'll be talking about the philosopher Al-Kindi. We'll begin first by just talking about his life and talking about his um, upbringing and the sort of cultural context in which he begins to uh, he begins to write and he begins to formulate ideas before talking about some of those ideas and, and the sort of context in which he is is discussing um, these principles. So. Uh, Al-Kindi was a philosopher and a mathematician and a, a, an individual who was uh, very much uh, an intellectual who was born in around 801 AD in, in, in Iraq and he would die in 873 AD in, uh, again circa uh, around that time circa 873. So he lives quite a few hundred years after Boethius, um, and Al-Kindi specifically is often hailed as this sort of, quote, philosopher of the Arabs, his role being the introduction and the adaptation of a lot of the Greek classical texts, specifically and particularly people like Aristotle, into and uh, incorporating into the Islamic intellectual tradition. So in a similar sense that Boethius um, translated a number of very important classical writings into the sort of Christian doctrine and into the Christian world, into in the sort of the Roman Empire, um, Al-Kindi is, 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 is hailed as an individual who did something very similar, but into Islamic tradition. He was educated in Baghdad. Uh, at the time, Baghdad was uh, the capital of the Abbasid Caliphate, uh, which was seen to be and considered um, a major um, historical center for, for learning and for culture and for, and for development. He enjoyed the patronage of quite a number of um, uh, a number of very key leaders within the caliphate itself. Uh, this is something that again you can make a comparison back to Boethius. Boethius was an individual who managed to uh, obtain authority and obtain a certain degree of prestige and, and political power through the rising in the ranks, through patronage from various different kings and various different senatorial leaders. So there are a number of, um, there are a number of, 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 of caliphs who were uh, very much in support of the works and the writings of Al-Kindi and supporting uh, a number of different um, pieces of writings that he had contributed. 
The institution uh, of the House of Wisdom, um, uh, the, the renowned House of Wisdom, would actually play a very crucial role when it came to the uh, incorporation of classical texts into the Arabic. So the renowned House of uh, Wisdom, the Bayat al-Hikmah, um, was something that was a particularly important institution within this center, this hub for, for arts and for learning and for culture within Baghdad. So, as I noted, and as, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, when it comes to the contributions that Al-Kindi made, it wasn't just philosophy, it was, also, it was also mathematics, it was astronomy, it was medicine, and it was music, all of which were obviously very important. And this kind of harkens back a little bit to the ways in which uh, the ways in which a lot of the uh, a lot of the classical philosophers, a lot of the ancient philosophers uh, in the ancient Greek world, at least, uh, were not just philosophers. They didn't seem to consider philosophy as distinct from all the other things. It was just considered to be part of science. Similarly, Alkindi was a mathematician and an astronomer as well as a philosopher. So let's begin then. This is sort of a contemporary uh, drawing of what Alkindi may or may not have looked like. Generally speaking, when we think about what he did in terms of his philosophy, Alkindi is noted for his efforts to essentially harmonize uh, Greek philosophy with the Islamic world, with Islamic thought. Um, his works often sought to reconcile the ideas of rationalism and the ideas of epist epistemic rationalism, specifically within, within Aristotelian philosophy, and to reconcile that with Islamic theology, emphasizing things like the use of reason in understanding the divine um, and this is again something that is quite similar to a number of christian philosophers and christian writers who would spend a lot of time trying to reconcile the classical texts and to try and essentially write theories that are heavily influenced by the classical texts uh, but that are that have their own sort of theological and religious spin on them so the sort of reconciliation of aristotelian philosophy with christian doctrine is something that we see when we look at aquinas for example but we also see it with individuals such as alkindi but with relation to Islamic theology. So the interpretation of the classical texts, of course it is noted that he was a pioneer in uh, the translation of Greek philosophical works, um, Aristotelian philosophy being a very specific element of that. He believed, in fact, that the study of philosophy enhanced Islamic intellectual traditions, and by integrating these works into the Islamic, um, into the, into the Islamic world, into the Islamic theology, uh, you would facilitate what he described as sort of cross cross-cultural dialogue. With all that being said, and with that sort of uh, quite broad understanding of his, uh, of his contributions to philosophy, what about his actual theories in philosophy? Uh, well, let's begin by looking at his understandings of, of, of metaphysics. Uh, what does metaphysics mean and how is it actually approached within, within, within Alkindi's writings? Well, as you would imagine, he was influenced by the Aristotelian and the sort of Neoplatonic um, metaphysical ideas. So sort of taking, deriving from Aristotle and deriving also from the writings of Plato. He sought to understand what was considered to be the nature of existence. Um, he would explore concepts, for example, the idea of being and the idea of substance and the idea of essence. Fundamentally, metaphysics is this idea of being, becoming and reality. Um, and this is essentially the study that you do when you think about metaphysics. And so Alkindi's writings on metaphysics fundamentally struck at the heart of these ideas. He posited that all beings were contingent and that they derived their existence from necessary uh, from a necessary being and he of course would identify this necessary being as the god of the quran um, we will get to in a couple of lessons time the idea of uh, the idea of the Kalam cosmological argument for the existence of God. But fundamentally, this is sort of the fundamental groundworks to the Kalam cosmological argument. The idea that things are contingent, or at least the universe is contingent, it had a beginning, and, and therefore, because it had a beginning, it had to have, it can't have been infinite, and because that is the case, it has to have been contingent, and if it was contingent, it has to be made by, uh, by something that was necessary, and that necessary being is, of course, God. Contingence essentially refers to 
the idea that if something is contingent, it means that it requires something for its creation. If it is necessary, it just means that it is um, something that can exist irrespective of anything else. It has to have existed irrespective of anything else. And so when Alkindi comes to the conclusion that all beings are contingent, that means that they have to derive their existence either through infinite regress, either everything is contingent and everything existed infinitely, or you have to come to the conclusion that there was some point at which necessity begins and that point is of course according to the uh, according to the islamic uh, theology and according to christian theology is of course god now um this is somewhat linked with the concept of um of the aristotelian theory of the prime mover um and this is of course linking as well to one of alkindi's central metaphysical concepts the idea of the first cause the unmoved mover is something that aristotle conceives of uh, alkindi argued that there must be a primary cause that initiates all motion and existence in the universe according to him this is of course god the god of the quran um, who is the ultimate source of all being and is also the cause of all causes um, there was an emphasis placed quite heavily on this idea that the first cause the nature of which was a unique creature of eternal and self-sufficiency We can obviously see and draw very easy conclusions between our Kindi's uh, conception of God and elements of Greek philosophy and Islamic philosophy, um, just like God is beyond all attributes and cannot be comprehended fully by human reason. All of these ideas are very much interwoven with basic Greek philosophy. And you will see when we get finally get on to looking at people like uh, Aquinas, Thomas, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, that his theories of the cosmological argument are very similar to these ideas, because essentially Christianity and Islam are not particularly that distinct from each other. They're not very different in terms of the basic conceptions and the basic ideas and the basic mythos, uh, mythos that existed. In fact, Islam is considered to just be a, a, a continuation of uh, our understanding of Christianity. So the, the religious foundations are very similar, but so too are the classical foundations because Aquinas was also very much interested in Aristotle. So the sort of, with Alkindi and a number of other uh, Islamic philosophers, you've got uh, Arist Aristotelian philosophy meets Islamic theology, but with Aquinas you have Aristotelian philosophy meets Christian theology, and given that Islam and, and Christianity aren't so different, you see that the theories converge together to be quite similar in terms of their attributes. So, as I noted, just like with Christian philosophers and thinkers, the connection between philosophy and theology is very deeply enshrined. His cosmological views are influenced by uh, Neoplatonism and sort of taken that with a quite um, with a, with a, with something of a of an Islamic spin, with an Islamic um, uh, fra uh, a little a twinge of Islam uh, <laughs> theology uh, attached to it. He did reject some Aristotelian ideas, though, however. He, he would still reject, for example, the Aristotelian notion of the eternal universe because he believed, in fact, that there had to have been a beginning, uh, and this beginning was, of course, God. And just like with basic Christian theology, um, God was the beginning and created the world ex nihilo, or an ex nihilo, uh, which essentially means out of nothing, through speech, theoretically. Um, and this is obviously a creationist view which aligns with the basic teachings of Islam. If you enjoyed this lesson, make sure you like and subscribe. We're going to do some more videos on uh, Islamic uh, theology and Islamic philosophy uh, in this early medieval period over the next sort of four or five lessons. Uh, and then we will start to move back on to looking at Anselm and uh, to Aquinas and Maimonides and all of these other uh, medieval thinkers sort of as we go into the sort of high Middle Ages. For those of you who want to know a little bit more, want some citations and further reading, the Cambridge Companion is, of course, always very, very prevalent. In terms of further reading, um, Inglis's uh, medieval Medieval philosophy in the classical tradition in Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. Uh, the Rauchlich textbook from 2002 is a very, very good and useful source because, of course, as you can see in the title itself, it draws on not just the Christian tradition, but it also draws on Islam and Judaism, which is obviously something that we're talking about in this particular chapter.